Well, thanks everybody for joining today on uh, today's webinar. Today we're going to talk about how to improve some renderings. Um, my name is Richard Fennell, the Global Training Manager at Luxion, makers of Keyshot. And today we're going to be focusing some on workflow. We're, we're actually going to be a little bit all over the place. So if you've been watching some of the recent webinars, it's going to be a little bit similar, but also different because this one's going to be a little bit less structured. And I want to show a lot of examples. Uh, we took a look at the questions and kind of comments that you guys had with the signups. And so we'll try to address as many of those uh, as we got. And uh, so some of those are just going to be uh, kind of built in as, as answers. Uh, but we'll start out today by looking at some, what I would say, example renderings. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of it is uh, some of the responses that we got or questions that we got were in regards to like, how do I, how do I make it look better? Or how do I control this or that? Um, so one of the best ways I think to start off is actually to show you some examples of some really, really good work. And then we'll go ahead and um, take a look at some Im images that could be improved upon as well. And then we'll jump into KeyShot and then uh, we'll start actually working through the workflow. Um, and uh, as usual, you go ahead and if you have questions, uh, go ahead and type them in. And uh, we've got Rex and Will and Josh uh, all, all uh, listening in and they can, um, they can go ahead and, and respond to those there. Uh, also, because it always gets asked, um, is this being recorded? Yes, definitely. And it will be available on, uh, on YouTube later. Uh, so we'll run through the hands-on and then um, just getting back to the topics here. We'll also then go into kind of an open Q&A and so we'll try to address as much as we can there with whatever extra time we've got. Um, always we get asked what are the computer specs, same machine as uh, the last two or three times for the webinars. It's a Mac Pro, I'll be running on the native Mac side so we'll have 16 cores to work with and uh, 16 gigs of RAM and it's a single socket Xeon. So it's pretty punchy even though it's just a single socket machine. Um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll, cover, we'll cover a broad variety of topics. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and jump into it. So what I want to show at first, you know, if we talk about kind of troubleshooting scenes, you know, how do you make your images better? We've got a, we've got some examples. Most of these are examples of things that were uh, on our forum, but I wanted to call out a few specific things. Um, and so here, in, in no real order, I'm going to show a bunch of cool images um, and want to talk about some of the things that work really well for them. So this is a, is a fantastic um, uh, rendering by Magnus of this uh, this guitar and it's got a lot of really neat stuff to it and so what I'd like to do is kind of point out some of the commonalities on what makes a really good image instead of necessarily by you know breaking down like taking crappy images and talking about what makes them good or bad you know here's something like this uh, I just want to talk about a few things um, a lot of it isn't necessarily 100% tied to KeyShot. So that's that's where this is also gonna be a little bit of a departure because uh, if you take a look at this, uh, there's some things that work really well just as an image or a composition. And it's one thing that we uh, we talk about in our on-site uh, uh, trainings about actually creating these images that are compelling. And so this one is an, an awesomely detailed model it's it's got a lot of uh it's got a lot of complexity to it you know and you can see even some of those strings on the guitar are fully modeled but things that work really well uh, the materials are a one-to-one -one representation of what they would be in uh, real life uh, you can see there's like subtle imperfections on the metal itself um, you know the wood is really nicely textured there's a little bit of depth of field as well so you can see that kind of blurring that's one of the things we'll talk about in the hands-on se session um, the colors all work together really, really well. There's a little bit of a vignette, which you know helps emphasize this kind of center kind of focus. Uh, when you start talking about composition, composing an image is really important. And this one is everything you know totally centered right in the smack dab brutal of the middle of the screen, but it, it works really well because it calls out these kind of details on the material. So really killer macro shot. Um, some other kind of examples. So another another image from the forum that I pulled because it was a it was a great example. We see a lot of images that you know it's like product sitting on a white background, and this does a an excellent job of of creating more of a composition. So when we talk about a rendering, you have to think of it kind of in context. Is it going to be in a presentation? Is it going to be in an advertising or a banner or a, you know an email blast or whatever it is? So when you start thinking about your renderings, think of them in terms of where they're going to live. So something like this, 
uh, does a really good job of showing in this case, you know, kind of the product family. Uh, so we have these, it's an interesting kind of orthographic view, but it does a good job of showing everything and we see a lot of detail. The model is, is really nicely detailed. Uh, there's good work on the texture and the materials. Um, this one is also really nice because the, the kind of background isn't a pure white. It's actually, it looks like there's a material applied to the ground plane and we'll run through something like that. Uh, but here you can see that the ground plane itself is slightly reflective. Um, I'd have to ask the person who put this together and his forum name, I think is up here. I could be wrong. I'd have to double check that. Um, but you know, it looks like there's probably metallic paint that was being used on that ground plane, which is why we get some reflectivity that's really sharp and then a, a little bit of roughness in there. Uh, so just, just going through some of these, right? So here's another, um, um, this customer is actually focused or we, we did a customer spotlight on them. Uh, this image, another fantastic one, you know, really interesting kind of composition, interesting ground plane. Uh, the material and texture work on the model itself looks really, really nice. There's good contrast. Uh, there's a definite focal point. It's nicely balanced as an image. Uh, the colors all work really well together, kind of monochromatic, uh, depth, definite, you know, depth of field usage to talk, you know, to show what's important in that image. Um, here's another great one by uh, John Seymour. Uh, this one really nice kind of macro view, a good you know mix with a lighting. If you if you take a look at this image and the colors that are in this image, we get some really nice kind of warm tones. So those kind of orangey reds, and then we get these uh, a little bit of the the cool dark metal, which uh, which is kind of a, a contrasting color to that. So that works really well. That depth of field again, really nicely modeled or detailed model. You can see that we're getting these kind of rounded corners and those are all catching highlights. Um, so it's not to say that every image that you create needs to have depth of field and these kind of check boxes, uh, but it does work for creating a, a more compelling composition, which I think is the goal of creating these images. You don't just want to render out a good image, you know, think about where it's going to live and what message you're trying to convey. Here's another really great one, uh, super image, uh, a website that adds uh, 3D scans, I think, has a bunch of free models and maybe if I could find it we can throw that into the YouTube uh, description where you can download this model but um, really great work on the textures on the metal itself the model is fantastic you know we're getting these these nice uh, nice texture and then really strong depth of field really shallow depth of field but works well to kind of create this composition uh, nice you know nice kind of contrast between the ground itself and the background of the dark not solid but really blurry gray uh, ties that together well so just you know a bunch of different images want to talk about these I think Simon Williamson come compose this image together here and again that there's a really nice sense of depth with this image this composition the colors themselves we're talking about complementary colors so you get the blue and the yellow. So they, those are contrasted, but uh, work really, really well. The focal point on this one is kind of down at the bottom, uh, as opposed to the, the majority of the image is this blurred out robot in the background. But uh, we really see what the, the focal point is there. Uh, and then the addition of a ground plane with some slight roughness to it. I'm not sure exactly what was used here, but maybe anisotropic, maybe the ground. Uh, I'm not totally sure. Uh, but it's a really cool image and it um, is a good example of kind of kind of image composition. So that's the kind of stuff that I, I keep in mind uh, here. Here's a nice one by uh, Jacob Fine. And uh, this is really nice uh, model, really great texturing work as well. So we really see what that uh, that candle looks like. Um, and then the reason I mentioned this one is because uh, with the use of color here, this is a great one, you know, the background color. Um, is actually matching the object color itself. And so we can either do that by using a solid color and throwing a vignette in, which is possible, or using a back plate. So this is, this is nice as a composition. Uh, it's really nicely centered. You know this is the important thing, but it, it creates a really compelling image because that's all tied together, you know, same color all over the place. So those are kind of the, some of the, 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 the things that you can consider when you're working. Last one here. Really fantastic work by uh, Webb de Vlam out of Chicago. Uh, and you can see here that we've got uh, this really nice composition, good uh, 
uh, kind of slightly off center. We've got these three products. The colors are tied together extremely well. So the same colors that are being used over here on the right hand side, you can see them showing up on the left hand side. So good balance there with the color kind of offset. Uh, good staging as well. So you can see, you know, we have this kind of placeholder geometry. Um, that's this kind of simple painted plane, but that works really well and it kind of props up the devices. Looks like this is a little Pico projector or mini projector. Um, but yeah, so those are some great examples of stuff you, you can do with your scenes to, um, to kind of help them pop a little bit more. So let's, uh, here's some, some images that I've, uh, I've put together, you know, in the past couple of months for various purposes. So if we want to kind of critique them, you know, so this, this is an example of, uh, uh, rendering that's just way too busy. Uh, it's got way too much going on here. It's not really interesting. No, no focal point. Um, it's pretty there's no real contrast in here. If you kind of squint at it, the classic trick of, you know, does this image have good contrast? No, it all just is kind of blurry. So there's, you know, this is a great example of a, of a boring image because your eye really doesn't know what to look at. Um, here's another example of this is a model that was downloaded from TurboSquid, much like that one before it, where the image itself looks cool. You know, this is our, our cooler with a, with a bunch of, uh, uh, beverages in there and um, that looks good but if you look at the rest of the image this composition is kind of boring um, so that's you know stuff that we can work on as opposed to uh, let's say something like this which I would say is a better example of some kind of product in context and this one was used for the uh, I think it was the the textures and labels webinar and um, you know, here it's just you know looking at the ground plane and seeing how much that adds to it, and how interesting it is using these high resolution textures. The textures used here were from Polygon.com, two eyes and P O L L I or P O L I I G O N. Uh, we use those textures a lot. They're really fantastic, high quality, and then like a nice, a really nice high quality environment as well that really, uh, really makes that work well. So um, that one, here's another one, love the polygon textures. Um, you know, this isn't a product shot, but it's kind of an interesting rendering and uh, a little bit of caustics here in the scene. And then that ground plane showing some interesting textures again to kind of, you know, create that composition of like what's what else is in my camera field of view, not just this little water droplet. Um, but yeah, really, really good textures that, that came from that website to, that were applied there to make that look really good. So lots of examples, um, and we'll get into it a little more in the hands-on. Um, but yeah, like this one, here's, here's another example of a cool-ish image, but kind of boring because we don't know which cube to look at. The cubes themselves are, a, they were a kind of a test for, you know, lighting and translucent materials, putting them inside, and then, uh, rendered out as a proof of concept, but as like an actual composition doesn't necessarily work that well. So that's one of the things I wanted to talk about a little bit today because they're good to keep in mind. So this image was the one that was um, was created that we used in the, the actual uh, newsletter image. And so we'll run through this one a little bit later. And so anybody who's gone through our on-site training, uh, at least with me, has might recognize this camera if you've seen this before in previous content, you know, webinars and whatever. Um, but in this case, you know, that same model was put into a scene that was just a little bit more interesting. You know, we've got this interesting ground plane and a, a ramp in the background as well. Um, and then just exploded out so we can actually see all that. So it gives the, the, the image itself some movement, which is, uh, makes it a lot more visually compelling and interesting. Uh, a little bit of depth of field as well. And this is using one of the environments that's already in the, uh, the Keyshot library. Um, so yeah, we can break this one down a little bit more later and we'll talk about kind of the how to, um, but yeah, just as a way to get started, I thought that would be an interesting way to do it. Talk about images that, uh, that can tell you a little bit more or show some really cool examples. And I definitely have to drop our, um, our forum on this one. If, uh, you haven't seen these kind of images before, uh, definitely take a look at our forum. Also. Uh, take a look at our Facebook page or our Twitter or Instagram or Tumblr. Um, we're always we're always posting and reposting and promoting this kind of content because uh, yeah, this is this is really you know this is this is stuff that pushes uh, the tools a little bit farther, which is always nice to see. 
So we'll go ahead and we'll hop into Keyshot and let's talk about some of the things that we can do to help out uh, with, our, with our renderings and with our model. Uh, the model that we're gonna be using today, I grabbed the toaster. Um, this one's from GrabCAD. Um, you can see the name of the person who modeled it right here. So that's what we're gonna run through and we'll talk about setting this scene up. And I grabbed the toaster because it's, uh, it's a nice looking design, but it's, it's, it's a model that anybody could download if they wanna play with it themselves. It's also not super complex. And you know, um, instead of downloading a really slick car model that's really easy to make cool, uh, sometimes rendering something like uh, just a simple toaster can be a little bit of a challenge. So um, we'll, we'll bring that in. We'll talk about a little bit of workflow there. Um, Okay, so let's go ahead and import that model. I'm gonna bring in the, the actual, let's try the SolidWorks model. I'll go ahead and bring that in. Pretty sure everything here is set to the default. Maybe I changed the up orientation. Um, other than that, we'll just keep everything at the default. Um, and uh, actually I bumped up the tessellation to 0.25 so that let's go a little bit more. We'll get a little bit higher quality geometry as opposed to just the base of 0.2 and we'll go ahead and import that. Again, this is a really simple model, so it's, it's a good one to kind of talk about some of this stuff. And so what I did before starting today is um, I, uh, I set everything back to the default. So we've got our default startup environment and pretty much everything else should be at the default. So I think this is gonna be a, a really good starting point. Um, okay, so one thing I tend to do whenever I start working is uh, really one of the first things is I, I think about what my final output is going to be as far as, you know, whether this is going to go on a PowerPoint slide or in an email or something like that. And uh, so I plan, okay, where am I going to actually be seeing this image? So what I tend to do is I, I tend to plan for my final output. Like if I know this is going to be put onto a TV for a presentation, then generally what I'll do is I'll go up either to image here or over on the project window and I'll go to my resolutions and I'll pick something that's gonna scale up really well for, for example, here 1920 by 1080. If I do 1280 by 720, that's gonna give me a 16 by nine aspect ratio um, and that's gonna look good when I scale it up. You'll notice in this happens that uh, if I try to scale my window, um, or if I move my window around, it's not re remembering that resolution. So uh, what I'll do here is I'll just uh, change that back to, uh, let's see, 1280 by 720. And then I'll also hit this little lock resolution button. So I've locked the aspect ratio, I've locked the resolution. That should also be respected up here under my image. And then if I uh, double click on my toolbar, I maximize the window and now I retain that, uh, I retain that 16 by nine aspect ratio. So I kind of plan for that kind of image. Um, so that's one thing, always figure out what you're gonna be doing uh, as your final image uh, to help frame it. So from here, let's talk a little bit about materials. So in regards to specifically this model, um, what I tend to do is I will look at reference imagery. That's always, uh, that's always helpful. And that's helpful anywhere from the design stage to other renderings or trying to create your product shots. So I um, just quickly did a, a, you know, an image search and found some comparable models. I don't think this actual concept here is in production. I could be wrong, or at least I couldn't find images of it. So we can kind of base our design off of something like this, and this is gonna work fine for us. So we'll, we'll do mostly dark with some kind of uh, a metal material. Um, so it's always good to look at reference for what you're trying to recreate. And uh, so here, um, we've got our assembly. It's actually a, a pretty basic sort of model. It doesn't have a lot of parts to it. So let's go ahead and start applying some materials. Um, I'll go in and let's find uh, under plastic, I'll just get a hard shiny black plastic and I'll drag it over onto these parts which are probably gonna be hard shiny black plastic. Um, one thing you'll notice is that I have the kind of default startup environment. So if I zoom out, you know, this is that's what I'm looking at. Um, and one of the best ways to, I think, get a little bit more drama out of your, um, your renderings and a little bit more depth is to take a look at some of the other environments that you have. I don't really, I don't tend to use the default very much. Um, I'll usually go in and find some environment that works really well. Um, and this is, I don't, I've, I, 
I repeat this a lot because it, it is pretty important, you know, like the more dynamic your lighting is, the uh, the better your, your actual rendering is going to look. And I've got a kind of a quick example of that rendered side by side if I could find it. Let me see. Toaster images. Here we go. So, um, yeah, did some, did some quick ones here uh, just to see what this would look like. So this one I had my materials reverse. It's actually before I looked up the model and what it should look like. Uh, but here's uh, this toaster. It's got, you know, got some materials applied to it. And here it is with a default or the startup lighting environment. And this one next to it is just the three panel straight and it makes a huge difference. This other one also has a little bit of depth of field and it's subtle, but here you can see this is in focus, that's out of focus. And we'll talk about creating that. Uh, but if I toggle back and forth, there we go. Uh, startup environment with the startup environment visible, as opposed to here now actually using a, a, an environment that has a little bit more drama to it. We see better definition here, uh, as well as on the buttons. If I go back and forth, you can see how flat these are uh, versus one that has a little bit more contrast to it. So that just that shows the forms and the materials a little bit better. Um, so that's something I pretty much always recommend doing, you know, try some different environments. I, I tend to prefer the three panel straight. Uh, that's a good one. One of the downsides to uh, some of the, the um, environments that are in our library is that if I, uh, if I go to my environment tab and I rotate this one around our model, um, the environments that are in the library uh, tend to be somewhat low resolution. So you can see this is a 2K or 2000 pixel wide image. So that would be, that kind of explains if you have ever seen a reflection that looks a little bit pixelated. Well, um, what I've done is um, under, let me see here, my environments, I've created a custom environment using the HDRI editor. Uh, and this one is an 8K uh, image. So it has way, way more information. Uh, it'll give you sharper reflections. It's gonna look, look a little bit better. I don't wanna focus on pro um, and the environment editor, but this is a nice kind of custom environment um, that I created. And uh, I've actually uploaded to the cloud. So if you've ever messed around on the cloud library, you can download this environment uh, right now or today. It's three panels custom 8K, and it's a, it's a custom environment. Let me see if that's gonna open up. Uh, that has a bunch of pins in it. So those of you who are pro users can take advantage of this. Uh, there are even some half pins and some, uh, some fancy pins like ground shadow pins uh, that are disabled. So just kind of a teaser there, but if you have pro, uh, you can download, download this and modify it. If you don't have pro, you can still download it and you will get better, sharper shadows than uh, the lower resolution environments that, uh, that are existing in the background right now. So I just wanted to call that out. But what this is allows us to do is now just really give us uh, some more contrast in our image. So that's one of the first things that I tend to do. Um, okay, so let's zoom in and let's let's take a look at some of these details in here. Um, and I just am right clicking and I am using the look at to center my camera on a part. So let's say we have uh, we have our logo here. I'm going to go ahead and select this piece of geometry and I'm going to unlink it. So let's say the logo uh, was going to have a material on it um, under my metals. I'll just go to the chrome. I can get just a basic. Uh, let's see if I just have a simple basic chrome, chrome polished, apply it here. Uh, so one thing that works really well um, to make your, your renderings look better is to model more detail in. And I'm, I'm going to pull up John's image because I showed that briefly, but uh, I, I want to really call it out. So for example, here on this image, uh, you can see that there are, there are radii that have been applied. We've got some rounded edges on our parts. Um, so if I take a look at this model, this model does not have those rounded corners. Um, however, in Keyshot, let's say we wanted to add those. If you select a piece of geometry like I've selected there, uh, there's a little drop down that says rounded edges. And if I just grab this slider and I drag it, this is not actually going to modify my geometry. Oop, grab the wrong piece. There we go. Um, but if I select this piece of geometry here and I hit that radius slider, there you go. It's giving us an approximation of a rounded edge. So I'll do something like 0.1 
And now if I deselect that part, you can see that I've got these nice kind of rounded corners on there. It's not totally perfect. It's not as, as sharp as modeling it in, uh, but we have made a lot of improvements on that. So if you haven't tried out the rounded corners in a while, they have gotten much, much better. So now if I zoom out, uh, and I take a look, you can see that instead of that part just kind of fading in, let's back it down to nothing, right? So kind of coplanar, kind of boring. But now if I select it, hit the point one on my radius, um, there you go. Now we're getting a little highlight on there. So it's a great way to add a little bit more detail to your, uh, to your parts. And we can um, a assign a rounded corner onto any piece of geometry. Um, the units are not based off real units, they're key shot units, um, but they, uh, they, you can go in and um, you know, add that on a part by part basis. Uh, so other materials in here, let's take a look at. Um, I'll do a quick run through. I, I started with a pre-made material. Um, basically, I made like a, a faux stainless steel. So um, I just wanted to start with this one. So I wanted it to be look like stainless. Let's say this was like a uh, this was the step down in our price classes. So it wasn't using real stainless. It was used like looks like stainless material. This was made with metallic paint. Uh, and I can also throw this one on the cloud, but we uh, we covered this, how to make this kind of material in our webinar on uh, metals, all about metals. Um, so it's a metallic paint with a brush texture for the metal color and then some metal roughness in there. And I still have the clear coat uh, set to zero, the clear coat roughness, so I get kind of a glossy reflection. So that's, uh, that's our material there. Um, it looks like we also want to modify some of these materials. So let's say for this button here, for example, I can go in and I can, uh, I'll actually go to, I'll select this part and then I can click on it and I'll unlink it. And then now we can just uh, double click on these parts right here because that's now a separate piece of, uh, or an unlinked material. I'll get rid of the brush texture. Uh, so now we'll just have kind of a nice shiny uh, metal finish for those buttons. Okay, so real quick, just a couple of quick material tweaks, nothing, nothing too complex here, kind of the toaster part itself. I'll just make that a chrome. So we'll go back to our basic chrome, drag it on there. So that's just nice and reflective. Um, and let's say we want to add a little bit of texture to this, you know, and in, in an ideal world when this comes out the mold, it's super smooth and glossy and perfect. Uh, but let's say we want to put a little bit more, uh, more detail in that material. I'll double click on it. I can uh, go into my textures on that hard, shiny plastic black, and then I can go to the textures here and I'll add a bump texture and I'll add a, uh, I'll add a noise texture to the bump. And so here you can see that now it's got a little bit of uh, texture to it. So um, this I tend to use a lot to add a little bit of realism. Uh, let's say I also throw a little bit of roughness on there, but now I get more of a, a kind of semi-gloss finish. And if I zoom in, I really get some actual texture on there. So again, um, some some realism can be gained just by adding some of those uh, some of those 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 details in as far as the material goes. Uh, most materials have some sort of imperfection to them, so you know even on a microscopic level, so it helps to bring that stuff in. Uh, and actually show it. Another thing that I tend to do, and you'll notice that if I go into this, this brush texture here, um, the colors that define the brush have a little bit of blue to them. Um, what I tend to do is I, I try to stay away from the colors that are, you know, as I'd call them like straight out of the tube, you know, like it's a, it's a stock material. So even something like a black, what I'll, I'll usually do is I'll add a little bit of color to it. Um, if I wanted that to match perfectly, I'd find a really dark blue. In this case, I'll go for something like a really, really dark, uh, let's say kind of cyan or kind of a green. We'll really desaturate it a lot. Um, but if you talk to anybody who works with like color material finish teams, a lot of time, even like blacks or grays um, have a little bit of a tint to them. And I find that adds to the realism as well. So that's something I'll usually try to put into some of my materials. Um, even whites, you know, you'll have cool whites and warm whites and off whites. And so just going beyond kind of the standard colors, 
uh, is a good way for boosting the realism. So if I go to my environment tab here and, uh, you know, we want to drop this into a presentation, you know, if we put that on a white background, we've got our, we've got our kind of stock image and we've all seen this. And, and so let's talk about ways we can, we can make this uh, a little bit more interesting. Um, I actually rendered out again, some, some images that I can reference here, just cause I want to talk about kind of composition and what we can do. So here's that same one just rendered out and, uh, it's pretty boring. Um, the background color is dark, which actually helps helps make this pop a little bit more. As I've, I've recently heard, dark colors recede and light colors advance, so that's nice out here in the forefront. We see our model, and that does a good job. Um, but if we want to make this a little bit more interesting, under the Environment tab, we can always add reflections, and that helps too, so that gives it a little bit more depth. Um, what we'll run through now is how to do things like add a little bit of roughness to your ground plane. That's going to make, make a more interesting composition. And one thing I would kind of, uh, uh, you know, engage you to think about is uh, like from a composition standpoint, you know, this is pretty heavily balanced to the left. You know, what can we put on the right hand side that would help balance that image a, a little bit better, right? So, you know, whether it's some sort of text in your image or uh, on your slide or let's say, um, you know, here's the same toaster, just pattern in the back, and it's smaller. It's at a different angle. I actually cheated on this one. I scaled it down too, so it's actually extra small, so it looks smaller in the background. But now we have kind of a, a asymmetry, but it works to balance it out a little better. Um, but yeah, so that's just kind of a technique you can use to, to create those kind of compositions. Um, so let's talk about what we can do with our ground. So, you know, something, if we were trying to replicate something like that, what I would do is uh, I would probably, uh, I wouldn't have the lighting environment visible. I almost never ever recommend that. I'd either work with, from a backplate image or we can just use a, a color. And in this case, I'll use my eyedropper tool and I'll just sample one of those colors and it pulled that saturated green and I'll darken that a little bit more. And uh, I'm just using green so it stays on the color value or you know, it's the same, it, it ties that together. Um, and here, I've got my object just kind of sitting on a, on a dark background. If I check ground reflections, then I get those reflections. Uh, and if that's where I wanted to, to stop, that'd be, that'd be fine. Uh, but what we want to introduce some more, uh, some more interesting ground effects, because I think that's a good way of adding more depth to your scene here. So I'll go up to the edit menu, I'll uh, hit add geometry, and then in this case, I'm just gonna add a ground plane. Uh, so I'll add that ground plane in, and, um, oh, it's just thinking, come on. There we go. It's added a plane to my scene. And uh, so you can see here we have a ground plane and it doesn't look any different. Um, so if I double click on this ground plane here, um, you can see that there's a special ground material. So my ground plane, key shot geometry that we added, if I either hit the edit material button or again, double click on the ground, that's where I can make modifications to my ground material. Where this material is different from any other different is it or other material it uh, it blends into the background. So for our color, it's going to blend on there. It's not going to be transparent. It's going to actually kind of work like a multiply layer in Photoshop. So here I can do things like I can change the uh, shadow color. Um, so you know change that to red if I wanted to. Um, I'll keep them at black. Uh, but something you can do is you can change the specular color. So the, this is the color of sharp reflection. So watch what happens here when I change this color. Um, if I go to a mid gray, you can see it gets more reflective. If I go to pure white, that means it's a fully reflective material. So you can control exactly how much reflectivity you want by changing the specularity or the reflectivity. Um, so here, highly like a light color means it's more reflective, more sharp reflections. Um, and so we see those nice sharp reflections. If we wanna break up that uh, reflection a little bit more, uh, I can take my roughness slider and drag it over. And now I'm adding roughness to that invisible ground plane. And uh, so you can see here, it's breaking up those reflections more and more. Um, Another thing you can do, and let's say we want this reflection to show even more, we can change the refraction index of the ground material. So this refraction index is, is, a, is a measured number and every physical material has a value. You know, uh, acrylic glass or diamonds or honey or salt water at room temperature. Um, 
they all have their own value. 1.5 is pretty common for a lot of plastics and paints. Uh, let's say we want this to be more reflective. This is one of the few times where I would change that refraction index. If I just grab this and I type in a value of something like three, that's about as reflective as Chrome is. So now my reflections are going to pop even more. So it's going to be really reflective. Oh, and I'll go all the way reflective with my, um, with my specular color. So now I have almost mirror like reflection. So I don't tend to mess with this refraction index often unless I'm trying to replicate some other material. In this case, I'm trying to replicate a shiny material. So going to something like three is going to give me more of kind of a chrome reflection. And then I can add a little bit of roughness to that crown. And so you can see here, that's really, really reflective. I'll back it out to 1.5 again. Uh, but just so you know, you can make this look more like a metallic reflection on the ground plane. Um, so yeah, specular color, reflectivity, we can add a little bit of roughness um, and we're good to go there. A uh, few other things that I wanna address here really quickly. Um, I showed it a bunch in those images, but depth of field, that's a question that we get all the time. How do you, how do you enable depth of field? Uh, so if I go over to the camera tab, uh, let's, let's, oh, let me make this list a little bit smaller. Um, we will go to our lens settings and I'm gonna back this. You can see here that there's, and it's also up here in our ribbon, uh, but there's a slider for perspective slash focal length. So uh, 35 is kind of a standard. I'll set this to 50 so it's a little bit less uh, less drastic the perspective uh, and then under lens effects this is where we enable depth of field so what is depth of field uh, depth of field here's the same toaster with inverted materials it's when we focus on one thing and everything else goes slightly blurry um, so what we need to do is we've got to be looking at our model which we are um, so the way the cameras work in Keyshot is that your object is stationary and the, the Keyshot camera kind of spins and zooms around your object um, so for example, here in my model, if I uh, right click on our logo and I hit look at, uh, this distance here of 646 millimeters, that's how far away the Keyshot camera is from where I clicked on that model. So what I can do is if I go here to my lens effects and I enable depth of field, right, you'll notice that now with Keyshot 6.2 by default, it's, it's saying that my focus distance is equal to my distance from my object. So you can see whatever this distance is, that's in, in this case in millimeters, um, that's, that's what's in focus. You can also change what's in focus by clicking on the select point of focus. And now if I click on the back over here, oh, double clicked. If I click back here, you'll notice that the focus distance has increased. So that means that something farther away is in focus, which is why this is blurry and uh, out of focus here. So I'll click back to get my focus on the front there. And then now we're back to this being in focus. Um, I'll hit done so I don't accidentally change that, uh, that point of focus again, but now our f-stop slider. The f-stop slider controls how much is in or out of focus. A small value means that you're gonna have really shallow depth of field. A bigger value means that there's more um, in, the, uh, in the depth of field. Um, you can always type in a bigger value as well. So if I go to something like 12, uh, it's a little bit more subtle. Um, and so now this is in focus and that's out of focus. So that was a question that we, we got. Um, and so now you can see that uh, here, right, we've got some depth of field that's not too distracting uh, waiting depth of field usually takes longer to render so you're just gonna have to uh, you're gonna have to add in some extra time or samples or if you're using advanced control bump that depth of field slider up to three which should be the default for six um, another small thing that I tend to see with kind of product shots that's a, a new feature that we added in Keyshot 6 uh, but is really helpful uh, here you can see that my vertical lines are kind of converging down. So we're getting, it's true three point perspective. Uh, but when I do product shots, this is something that you may want to consider. We added a lens that's called a shift lens. Uh, and what this will do if I click on shift and I hit the estimate vertical shift button, this is going to give me kind of two point perspective. So now you can see my vertical lines are vertical and I can adjust how much using this vertical shift slider. This just kind of depends, you know, this isn't a realistic view, um, but for architectural uh, type imagery 
or if I had six of these toasters side by side and I was getting that kind of uh, falling backwards look, then I can use this to align those. So that's, I don't always use it, but uh, uh, it can be really helpful in certain scenarios. So we have vertical shift. We also have um, horizontal shift, so I can shift that over. It still keeps my nice vertical lines. And then now I've, I'm, you know, I've got a, I've got a page on my presentation ready so that I can drop some text in and talk about all the cool features that, uh, that we get on this toaster. Um, but yeah, so that's a quick run through of some of the, the, some of the requests that we got, um, from the webinar, uh, sign up sheet. So I just wanted to run briefly through those. Um, let me save this file just in case I've got to go back to it. Um, so we'll just throw it in there. And uh, cause the last thing I wanted to just do here was just quickly break down a scene because it was the one that was in this, um, in the newsletter image. So this is this backdrop scene here. Uh, cause I was working with this and I thought it was pretty cool. Um, and it's, I just wanted to break this down cause you know, it's a way of creating, you know, a backdrop that can be used uh, for any product. So in this case it was used to uh, make that kind of camera floating here's that camera studio right so it took that model you know moved all the parts and then rendered those out um so what's going on in the scene here uh, well it's actually not an image uh, as a backplate so just like we added uh, let me go to my free camera just like we added a a, a ground plane something you can always do is up under edit you can add a backdrop ramp and so that's what's been added to this scene and if i double click on it it's just the ground material it's got a high refractive index so it's reflecting more like metal wood it's got a little bit of roughness uh, and the cool thing with this one is that the color is actually not coming from um, uh, the background there's a little bit of color in the background but if i make my lighting environment visible this is one that's in the keyshot 6 library and it's a good one because it's realistic uh, it's got a lot of light in it which is really cool but if i go back to my previous camera uh, what i've done here is i've used that lighting environment to light this scene um, and if i show you that kind of final render you can see the reflections of the windows it's got a lot of warmth to it which is really cool also uh, it's got some cool lights as well. So the lights coming in from the, the wind, the, the sky, that's the nice blue light you're getting, but there's still some warmth to it. So for that scene, um, what I did is under the environment, I just set that to a color. So our backdrop ramp is going to blend onto the background color, regardless of what that color is. Here's what it looks like on white or, you know, let's say like a super dark. No, that looks terrible. Let's go back to a light gray, right? But it's going to blend onto that background. So what I did was I just used, you know, a, a nice dark gray. Um, and then it's going to reflect some of that environment, which makes it really interesting. I get that nice highlight in the back here. Um, and then that's it, this kind of plate on the ground. So that was a metal material. Uh, that one is, is a little bit fancier. It's using uh, color and uh, bump and roughness textures. So it looks something like this, but it was blending uh, a galvanized uh, texture, which is in your material library or your texture library and a noise texture as well. And, you know, we can make this scene available uh, to download. Uh, but this one is interesting because it's just, uh, it's a good mix of uh, using the environment that's realistic to get good lighting, plus uh, plus the backdrop ramp in a in a kind of non-standard way, and then kind of a piece of placeholder geometry, um, which will give you just some more interest. So just like I showed earlier with some of those previous examples, um, you know, having a piece of geometry within this case a metal material to it and some textures can create a much much more interesting image. Um, and then for that last one, if I go back here, basically it started out right here and let's pretend our, uh, our sphere was that camera that was blown up and we can't blow this one up, but you know, we can, we can make our sphere kind of, uh, kind of float. And then if I go back to the camera, we can enable the depth of field. And so this was backed out a decent amount. Um, and this slider, I think max is out of like 256. So if you're not getting enough, just type in a bigger value. Uh, so here, if I set that to something like 25, now more is going to be in focus and then everything else is going to be gradually out of focus. So that's how that image was put together. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of a quick run through on kind of setting up a stage or a scene uh, so that you can get a, a more interesting composition out of it. 
Um, so those, that's, those are the scenes I wanted to run through. We've got about 15 minutes left for Q&A. Uh, I can tell that we've had a lot of questions already and a lot of them have been answered, so that's awesome. Um, but I'll go ahead and, uh, I'll, Josh, do we, have any, uh, do we have any additional questions that we can kind of uh, run through in the time that we've got? Hey Richard, um, I have some questions here. Actually, a, a really good one yeah. um, that Luis just asked was, how do I drag materials already in a scene to other parts without having to go back into the material library? That's an awesome question. Thanks for pointing that one out. Um, so Luis, uh, under your uh, project window, you have a, uh, uh, your, a list of in-scene materials. This same list is by default, uh, usually also populated down here as well. So I'll show that list. These are the materials that are currently used in the scene. So what you can do, let's say a couple different ways to apply materials. I can either right click on a part. Let's say I wanted to copy this material. So I could right click and I can copy the material that is the source. And then for the destination, I can right click and now I can paste a linked material or an unlinked material. But uh, if I do that, if I paste a linked material, then it's going to be applied. Uh, but the reason I showed that is because you can also just grab a material from your in-scene materials. So these are the, all the materials that are being used in the scene. If I just drag this onto another piece of geometry, that's a really fast way of applying uh, a linked material. So yeah, great question. Uh, if you know what all these materials are in your in-scene materials, then you've done a good job of material assignment. Uh, another one that came up was just uh, procedural textures and where to find those. Can you point those out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I just reset this material kind of back to uh, uh, back to standard material here, and I'll turn off my depth of field because that's a little bit distracting. Uh, so what are procedural textures? Unlike uh, the textures in your material library over here, uh, procedural textures are math-based textures, uh, so they're going to be a little bit different. So uh, if I double-click on a material and I go to the textures tab, so this metal material can receive textures, and those textures are, you know, some property, whether it's the color or the bump or opacity. Uh, they don't start on the left-hand side, not in your project window. They are inherent to the material itself. So all you have to do, uh, let's say for the, my metal material, I wanted to add uh, some sort of texture to it. You can select, let's say, color here, and then use your drop down. So under this drop down is where you can find your procedural textures, or these are your, think of them like a vector texture or math based texture. So here, if I set that to, um, let's say, spot, right, and let's scale this up, now you can see I have a bunch of spots on my, uh, on my metal material. So I'm using those as a color. And just like any texture, any image-based texture, if I drag this over to bump, now you can see those spots are being defined as the bump. If you hold down Alt when you drag, it'll duplicate. So now we have uh, this, this two color spot texture as both uh, my color and my bump. Another way to quickly uh, assign textures um, is if you right click on this little well, you actually have um, your options here. Those of you who have Keyshot Pro and have access to the material graph can also throw in some uh, utility nodes. Um, but yeah, so if I really quickly, let's say from this uh, properties tab, wanted to apply a, a texture, I could right click right here on that little icon. I could go into my textures and then I can throw in good old camouflage and then scale that up. And so now our color is being defined by this uh, camo color instead of just one single color. Uh, Luis is also asking if you can import your own textures or use textures that you created in Photoshop. Uh, sure, you can't use them as procedural textures because these are these are math. Uh, so these you know these are some algorithm that drives these. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Let's say I wanted to uh, use some uh, custom texture that I had created, like you said in Photoshop. Um, what I could do here is I could just um, 
let's see, do I have any toasters, or not toasters, sorry, textures. I can use any image as a texture, even though this isn't a good texture. Uh, I can simply, uh, actually, we'll, we'll grab this one. You can drag it directly into your scene onto the material that you want to apply it to. Um, and then you can apply it as, in this case, a color texture, right? You can also drag it directly here, and it won't do anything because I'm replacing that one, but you can drag and drop directly from uh, Windows Explorer or the Mac OS Finder. Um, if you don't like dragging and dropping, just double click, and then that will ask you for, uh, you know, uh, some, some directory that you can point to to grab those textures from. Uh, but yeah, you can absolutely use, you can't use a Photoshop file, but we can use any other raster graphic, PNG, JPEG, TIFF, anything like that. Mike Slivkin is asking if you can make that ground plane look like water with ripples. Sure, yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. So there should be a pre-made material in the uh, material library that's good for that. So this one will also be good because it is a solid piece of geometry. Uh, but if I go to my liquids folder, um, that material should be already in your library. So we have liquid water, we've got carbonated water, and then here's liquid water ripples. So if I drag that over, there we go. We have our liquid with uh, some ripples in it. And if I double click on that, we can see that that's a liquid material. Uh, and it just has a simple noise fract fractal texture applied to it. And you can scale that texture up or down to your liking. Uh, so this is a great one. Rex, I think one of the best times I saw that was in your sea do scene from back in the day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that material is pre-made. It's actually already in your library. Um, and then if you want to change the color of that liquid, just, you know, change it here. And now we have our, our nice blue ripply liquid. And something that's going to have a big effect on the appearance of water is the lighting environment that you can see being reflected on the surface. So definitely something to be aware of is, you know, you probably don't want to use a, a studio lighting environment if you're rendering right. water because it won't look yeah. realistic. Very, very good point. Yeah. So I would, I would, to, to illustrate that, this is going to look a lot better when I put it into kind of an outdoor scene. Granted, this is the exact opposite scene because it's like a total desert. Um, but, you know, the light reflecting off the sky is going to give me uh, a much, much more realistic looking material. Um, we have uh, somebody asking about colors, um, using colors from the library. Um, and how you can do that uh, to maintain the original material specs, but simply swap out the color. Um, to, um, ah, right, good question. Yeah, so let's say this was, uh, let's say, let's change this to paint. Um, and we know some, we, we actually know our Pantone color, for example. Yeah, so we can go to the colors here. Uh, in the second tab in our library are colors. Uh, what's nice about these is, so I changed that to a paint material, but now if I go down, we have both Pantone and RAL color definitions. Uh, so if I go to my Pantone solid coated, I can find some color, uh, and then I can just drag and drop the Pantone directly to the material. All the material properties stay the same. It's still paint, still has a bump texture, but now if I hover over the color, you'll see that it's gonna remember that this is Pantone 576C. Um, so yeah, you can do that. And if I wanna change out to a different Pantone, again, just drag and drop your different Pantone colors. Uh, and you can drag the Pantone colors onto almost any material. And as long as you don't modify that color, uh, you know, you don't change it from what it is, it should show you that Pantone hover. Uh, so you can always reference it there. Also good to know, just kind of as an extra little bit, uh, if you tend to use, let's say this Pantone color is your brand color, right click on it and add it to a favorite. And then you can always have that uh, quick to go. So if I add it to a favorite, I'll throw it into my Keyshot favorites. Uh, where do favorites go? They're this little tab on the right hand side that gets overlooked. But these are materials and textures and colors that I tend to use a lot. Um, but yeah, so it's a quick way to, to grab all those assets. Uh, another good question is how do you add thickness to a label? 
Uh, yeah, great question. So let's go ahead and uh, I'll unlink these materials and I'll set that one to, uh, let's go ahead and throw a label on here. So I'll go to my textures, labels, and I'll just throw the key shot icon as a label. So here we have our label. Whoop. And uh, what we can do is, uh, so by default now in Keyshot 6, all materials do have labels. That was a really big addition. Uh, so under my labels, you can see that the label type uh, is actually a drop down, and you can change the label material. So here, if I change that to metal, that's going to be shinier and more reflective than the paint material that it's on, and you can change these materials. Um, the reason I just kind of gave you that run through on the materials is that means that since it's a material, it can be textured. Just like with our paint, we I'll bring that noise texture back up, right? We can uh, we can have some texture on the kind of background material. Well, if I wanted to give that label some thickness, watch what I can do here. I'm going to select my label and then I'm going to hold Alt or Option and I'm going to drag it over to bump. Because now, if you take a look at that, you'll see that my label has a little bit of thickness to it. We're using that color texture as a bump texture in order to give it some depth. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we're, this isn't actually adding material thickness to it, but it will reflect the material. I'll put this into an environment that has a little bit more contrast to it. Um, here we go. Maybe that's too much contrast. Um, but we're going to be catching shadows and uh, highlights uh, from our peaks and valleys here. If I zoom in, you'll see that I'm catching some highlights and I'm getting some shadows. And that's coming from the bump texture on that material. Um, also, just kind of as a, as a bonus tip, if you apply uh, a bump texture to your kind of parent material and you want to see it on the label as well, go back to the textures tab, hit this little checkbox that says apply bump to labels. Uh, now that label also has a bump texture on it, something that we could not do in Keyshot 5. This is all new functionality for Keyshot 6. Real quick, touching back on colors, there was a good point. Um, somebody working with uh, like opaque materials versus like a clear plastic, and they're saying uh, when they drag a color onto the clear plastic, it doesn't appear the same. Um, and that's because the color in a clear plastic is actually defined by a different channel, the specular transmission. So maybe you can just quickly touch on that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, good call, Rex. Um, so we have, um, if I double click on this material here, our sphere, and I'll, I'll quit moving the camera. Um, promise. Okay, so uh, we've got a couple of different types of plastic materials. We have opaque and we have clear plastics and there's cloudy. There's all different breakups of plastics. Um, so if I get this shiny black plastic and I throw it on there, um, this plastic is being defined by two base colors, a diffuse color and a specular color. Um, and so this is, this is pretty crucial stuff to understand anytime you're doing any sort of rendering or working with materials in Keyshot. If you really want to look at like how light works, diffuse and specular are transmissions that you should know because it's uh, they're really important. Uh, so diffuse colors are colors that kind of scatter and they aren't they aren't super sharp and reflective. So if I take a color like this Pantone and I drag it onto my material, um, my the color think of like a piece of chalk color that hits that surface and then kind of scatters uh, is going to be that color of blue the specular color if i set this to black that's the color of light reflection of, of sharp reflections so with specular set to black i've essentially created a, a diffuse material so it doesn't have any sharp shininess to it it's just a light that hits it and scatters so i can control how reflective that material is, so this is a plastic material, I can control how shiny it is, the kind of really sharp reflections, by defining the specularity, right? So that's one way you can think of your plastic materials. Um, when we start talking about transparent plastic, so I'll go down uh, and I'll just change this material. I can change it from plastic to plastic transparent. And nothing happens. Well. That's because here, what I've done is uh, I've just enabled the ability to change transmission colors. 
this is the color of light that goes through a particular material. So for example here, what I'll do is I'll set this diffuse color to black because this is color that of, or this is the color of light that reflects off the surface. And right now it's pretty much absorbing all the colors, it's black. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drag this same, same Pantone color, but I'm gonna drag it over to Specular Transmission. This is now the color of light that goes through the material. So if you're talking about, uh, let's say a clear acrylic, I would change that to white. So now this is perfectly clear, right? Um, but if I hit cancel, now the color of that material is being de defined um, by the color of the light that goes through it. Essentially all the color that goes through it is now this Pantone color. You know, it's kind of like a, a filter in that regard, like a, or like a gel for, uh, for photography or a lamp or something like that. Um, so what happens here is even if you start with a transparent plastic, um, let's say we started with here, just a regular transparent plastic, Keyshot may not be smart enough. If you just drag the color on it, it's just gonna put that into the diffuse component here. So you kind of need to be mindful when you're dragging and dropping. When you get to these more advanced materials, they're defined by multiple colors. So instead of dragging it directly onto the material, drag it onto the specular transmission, and that's gonna change the color of light shining through it. Hope that, uh, hope that answers that question. Okay, we're getting towards the end here, but I think maybe we can cover one more topic, and that is the lighting tab and uh, kind of the different presets, maybe product versus interior, when you would want to use interior mode or caustics or... Ooh, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's worth a webinar, uh, which we did. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so the lighting tab is new for Keyshot 6. In Keyshot 5, it was under the settings tab. Um, so if you're still in Keyshot 5, this is, uh, this is going to be somewhat relevant to you, but we've added some new stuff in here. So the lighting presets are pre-made uh, kind of profiles that uh, work better for certain products. So uh, basic is the default one. So you can see here that when I'm in basic, stuff looks pretty good and that's fine. Uh, there's a performance mode, which turns down a lot of your render settings. Um, and whenever you toggle through these, like I go to product, uh, product is gonna look a little bit better in certain scenarios. All it's doing is unchecking and checking certain things under the hood that are gonna be uh, some specific control for um, you know, this model, whatever it is. Um, so the lighting presets, if you change any of those, also one thing that's just kind of curious to note. So right now I'm at product, but let's say I wanted product with better quality shadows. Uh, I, if I increase the shadow quality the minute I do it or the second, it changes to custom. That's because if you tend to work with your own custom settings, let's say I work with a lot of transparent materials. I'll bump the ray bounces up to something like 16, keep the indirect to one, always. Shadow quality, I'll have it at five. And so if I wanna save this as my own lighting preset for clear materials, let's say also I turn on ground illumination, I can hit this little plus and I can add a new lighting preset. If I, um, so here I'll call this clear products. And so now whenever I render out clear products, I'll use settings probably comparable to this. Um, and you can see I've customized my interior and you know, there's a pre-made for jewelry. Um, interior mode, if I enable that, watch what's gonna happen. Not a whole lot because the interior lighting algorithm is, is intended to light interior. So like a fully enclosed space that's primarily driven off physical lights like IES or area, area lights. Uh, so in this case, I won't see a very big benefit. If anything, it'll kind of get grainy and eventually it'll clear up. Um, but if you aren't doing interiors, I generally don't use interior modes. The only kind of caveats there is I'll use interior mode sometime if I'm rendering a scene with a lot of caustics or jewelry or something like that. Um, caustics, um, what are caustics? Caustics, uh, kind of an explanation I can give you is if you're sitting outside on a nice clear sunny day and you've got a glass of water and a glass of wine and the sunlight hits it and you see those cool patterns on the tablecloth, that's caustics. Caustics are when light gets uh, reflected and refracted and kind of focused in some area. And so in this case, if I turn on caustics, uh, I'm not going to see anything because we don't have a strong bright light source and you know our scene isn't really set up for caustics. We actually just did a blog post. If you go to keyshot.com slash blog, 
uh, that's got a, a scene all about caustics, how to set it up, and it actually has an example Keyshot file that you can download as well. Um, I don't think we have enough time to run through all of these. We did actually create a, uh, a, a, a webinar that's all on the render settings. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a really quick run through. Apologies for not being able to do that. And you know, that would take a good 30 minutes to actually get through some of the complexity here. No, yeah, I think that was good. Um, and there, there was actually one more thing uh, related to labels, mapping labels that we could touch on quickly, and that's the depth slider using normal projection. Cool. Yeah, totally. Um, so, uh, do I see it here? No, I don't. Uh, let's let's see what happens. So, whenever I double click on, let's let's add a label to my uh, clear plastic that we've created. Um, I'll double click on this, and let's talk about some of the common things that happen with labels, problems. Uh, so I'll go over to my textures and we'll grab this same icon um, and I'll drag it directly onto my material. And again, you can do this from the Finder, Windows Explorer, whatever. And I'm gonna let it go and I'm gonna add it as a label. And then I'm gonna hit OK. And you'll notice here that, um, well, let's scale this label down a little bit. It's too big. Looks like it is way too big. I'm not sure what my scene units are in here. Uh, that looks kind of crazy. Okay, it looks like a, a weird key shot eyeball. Anyway, um, so whenever you use a label by default, it's using a technique called normal project projection. So if you were to think of like a projector, like, you know, a light bulb with a, you know, an image and it's projecting it onto a surface, that's what we're doing here. We're actually projecting your graphic onto the geometry, regardless of the shape of your geometry, whether it's flat or organic or whatever. Um, so whenever you click on the position button and click on the surface, it uses that point right here in the middle where I clicked and it's projecting directly onto the surface depending on my current camera position. So watch what's going to happen here. If I click on position and I click, the position of that label is going to jump because now my camera is in a different place and it's snapping it right to the middle where I clicked. So that's how normal projection works. All the labels that you know are using normal projection we have a slider for depth this controls how far into the surface our label is actually projected um, if I go over here and I take a look at my scene uh, this was modeled in millimeters but I scaled this part up it's it's huge or something but whenever you're working with labels that depth slider controls how far into the surface that label is being projected so you know point one right it's not projecting very far into the surface so if it's ever kind of uh, clipping extend that depth so here you can see it's not projecting far at off enough so i'll set it to five and that'll be good uh, so let's take a look at this label down here this metal label that we added um, this was actually this piece of geometry wasn't scaled. I think it's like 30 centimeters or something like that. And you'll notice that this was applied with normal projection. Um, since that part was modeled in millimeters, this depth slider of one means that it's projecting one millimeter into the surface. And if I move my camera to the bottom, I don't see it. And that's that's good. I don't want to see it. But let's say um, I set that to something like 10. Um, since this piece of geometry is um, less than 10 millimeters, that means I'm seeing it on both sides. So the depth slider controls how far onto your surface, normal to the, uh, the surface itself, that label is projected onto the surface. If I click and I reposition my label over here, this is actually a really good place to see it, and I go back to my depth slider. If I drag this slider, you can see that it's controlling how far into the surface we're actually seeing it. So if I type in two, right, it's there. And it looks like, I think this little slab was like four millimeters or three and a half millimeters or something like that. Yep, looks to be right about three and a half millimeters ish. Um, but yeah, so that's how normal projection is gonna work and how the depth slider impacts your labels. Awesome. If uh, there are no more questions, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap up. Okay, cool. Well, thanks everybody for uh, for listening in today. Really appreciate your time. Uh, again, this session is going to be it's, uh, being recorded, and we'll post it on YouTube. 
um, you know, probably within a, a week or two. Uh, and you can always please subscribe to uh, Keyshot 3D on uh, YouTube, and uh, you can get notifications of new webinars, quick tips, tutorial videos, things like that there. Uh, but otherwise, I'll go ahead and sign off. Again, uh, thanks everybody for uh, thanks everyone for watching.